Good morning guys, so this is my first ever video and it's going to cover the development of the A38 Valiant, its design and testing, and why it's not as terrible as people often think. We'll start with the Valentine tank, an amalgamation of Vickers Armstrong Limited, Ellswick, Newcastle upon Tyne, or at least according to Vickers themselves. It was an infantry tank produced by the United Kingdom and Canada during World War II. More than 8,000 of these tanks, with many variants such as bridge layers and self-propelled guns were made, making up nearly a quarter of British wartime tank production. Development of the Valentine had begun in late 1930s, with plans submitted to the War Office on the 10th of February 1938. Vickers' previous work on both the Cruiser Mark I A9 and Cruiser Mark II A10, as well as the infantry tank Mark XI, were all conceptual ingredients in the design of the Valentine, and the end result was a tank with heavy armour, similar to the Matilda, but the suspension of the cruisers of the time. Valentines were some of the only tanks to see action throughout the war from start to finish, along with the Matilda A12, and never had an A number given to it. But what's not commonly known is it shared two sister vehicles, the Vanguard and the Vampire. Vanguard was one of the sisters to Valentine, and like many Vickers, had a V name, a trademark of that company. She differed in several areas from Valentine, her suspension consisted of six pairs of road wheels per side, each similar but slightly different to the larger outside pair found on Valentine. These were rubber-tired road wheels mounted onto independent transverse spring units, each supported by an internal spring and wishbone mount. Three top rollers were provided to support the upper weight and tension of the track, and the track itself was specified as 20 inches wide and of a manganese construction. It's not known what the real turret actually looked like, as to date no pictures of the three running prototypes have ever been found, although findings by noted author Craig Moore at the Science Museum do indicate that it may have been very similar to the later Valentine Mark IX turret. It is speculated that the original turret was later merged with Valentine when the War Office requested she would have a 57mm gun. Vanguard's hull was well sloped and should a crew of four. Power was provided by an AEC A189 petrol engine and each vanguard had a distinct side-facing air vent with an exhaust-mounted rear on the back deck. One of the more distinctive features was a very well-sloped pike nose. This sloping was the first true use of the pike nose design idea utilised long before the Soviets built it on tanks such as the IS-3. Vanguard's fate was thought sealed when the Ministry of Supply, who wanted the easiest and cheapest tank to be made, saw little point in having three similar vehicles when one would suffice, and so Vanguard got placed on the back burner, while Valentine was pushed into full production. Yet it would crop up again when a request for a tank with a 17-pounder gun mounted on the hull was issued. Several firms submitted designs mounting 17-pounders. Nuffields drew up two plans using their Crusader hull. One design featured an open gun shield and a forward-facing gun, but it was deemed too high a profile, and the troublesome reliability of Crusader was also called into question. Vickers chose to use their Vanguard hull as their ideal platform and built a wooden mock-up with a rear-facing 17-pounder in reverse position. Visible on this model are the distinctive road wheels and the side-mounted vents of Vanguard. Ultimately this ran into the same problem, with the Ministry of Supply wanting to use existing service vehicles, and so it was Valentine that would be adapted and would go on to become the SP-1, or Archer. The second vehicle is the elusive Vampire. The Vickers Vampire was the other sister to the Valentine and differed in several key ways. Gone were the varying odd sized wheels and instead it had four large Christie type wheels and no return rollers, but the rear drive sprocket remained more or less the same. The hull is well sloped and presumably well armoured with angled cheeks. The rear too shows a similarity with a sloped back plate, although the model lacks the large louvers of her sisters. The turret is large, so much it overhangs the side of the turret ring and from the number of periscopes would have been a three-man turret with either a 40 or 57mm gun. Vampire's fate had all but vanished, and until recently only three lines of text remained, although extensive researching over two years by myself turned up a series of photos showing the wooden mock-up. Vampire will remain at least, for the time being, a mystery, as while it now has known photos of the mock-up model, much of the data has been lost, while the opposite is true of Vanguard, which has a surplus of data, but lacks many photos. Swarmwood's The Valiant Development of what would become the A38 Valiant began in 1942, when Vickers were asked to produce a heavy assault tank. The specifications called for a vehicle with at least 100mm of armour in a 60-40 configuration, 
as well as thick side skirts and a six pounder gun. Vickers once again turned to their Vanguard hulls, of which it is believed two were running based on their service cards and later reports between Vickers and Chertsey. The new vehicle even retained the name Vanguard for some time before switching to Valiant and this is why we see both names referring to the same model when researching. The Vanguard or Valiant would have a six pounder gun, although a 75mm could be fitted, and she retained her well sloped pike nosed features with 114mm along with 4 inches to the sides and 3 inches on the rear and 25mm on the belly, giving it for its time excellent protection. Mobility was not treated as a priority for the Valiant, with a top speed of just 16 miles an hour or 25 kilometers an hour, as the assault tanks were to favour protection and firepower over mobility and Vanguard was originally an infantry tank so had never been designed with speed in mind, being comparable to Valentine in this regard. While at Vickers several engines were suggested. These were to either be the AEC A189 petrol engine or to adopt the General Motors diesel engine of 138 horsepower. Four tanks were to be built with these fitted under the designation Valiant Mark I, while two further vehicles were to be fitted with the Rolls-Royce Meteorite engine, then under development. Itself a cut-down version of the Meteor, with 400 horsepower under the name of Valiant Mark II. The road range was to be 100 miles, which again is rather low, however as an assault tank she would have been transported closer to her operational area. Valiant steering was done via a traditional clutch and brake configuration, and the design requirement specified a 5-speed synchromesh gearbox was to be used. Later tests showed that in trials against both the M4 Sherman and the Valentine that the gearbox and system provided little effort comparatively, although it was difficult to switch between the second and third gear. These problems also tend to crop up on Valentine. Work on Valiant continued at Vickers for only a relatively short time. The tank board in February 1943 suggested that all assault tanks be equipped with a 75mm gun, but this was not modelled onto the vehicle until after the war. Changes to Vickers production numbers from the War Office, along with less urgency for assault tanks suddenly, left Vickers looking for a new developer for the Valiant, and it was agreed that Rolls-Royce would take over the development at their clan foundry in Belper, Derbyshire, which had been working on Cromwells at the time. While at Belper, changes took place. The distinct side vents were changed, now facing up, and on the Valiant at Bovington you can see where this was done, with a thick plate welded over one side. It's not entirely clear as to why this was done, but the original plans from Vickers later showed this modification in relation to fitting the American engine. A second change was the addition of an armoured housing all around the transmission at the rear of the tank. This requirement meant adding protection in the form of welded plates to the bottom of the tank, with a further bolted inspection hatch which had two negative effects. The first was it created a lip or wedge on the vehicle's floor plate which should have created a severe hindrance over rough terrain, snagging and catching anything it passed over. While this is obviously a flaw, it would have in all likelihood been quite correctable in any production machine. A more impactful event was the increased weight. As we mentioned before, the Valiant was based on the Vanguard suspension, but this was rated to about 20 tonnes. With the weight creeping up it began to overload the suspension, thus compressing the springs, losing their elasticity over time. The original ground clearance on Vanguard was 17 inches, but with this new armoured rear end it lowered it down to just 14 inches. Today, as the vehicle has not been regularly checked, this suspension is down to just 9 inches under the welded plate section, and I've been under this tank and I can tell you it's a squeeze. However, one must bear in mind this compression has taken 75 years to get to this level. Two months after being handed over to Rolls-Royce, the Ministry of Supply passed the Valiant over to the Ruston and Hornsby group in Lincoln. This firm had very little overall design experience with anything tank related by World War II. Ironically though, their much earlier work in tracked vehicles had influenced some of the designers in World War I to build the first tanks. During World War II they helped produce Matilda tanks and the fated Cavalier tanks, but their main bread and butter was still shovel excavators and locomotives. This clearly showed in the modifications they made. They had altered the driver's position and added an unusual bulge-like armour section in front of him. This not only negated the advantage provided by the sloped armour, but added a shot trap of sorts, allowing rounds to skip up the armour and into the flat piece of plate protecting the driver's face. A new three-man turret was designed as well, with a particular heavy bolted faceplate. 
This was done to gain the maximum gun depression possible, minus 12 degrees. Yet in doing so, they created a large turret, which in turn required more armour, and thus increased the weight. In order to fit this turret onto a vehicle made for a smaller gun, they had to increase the turret ring, and this forced them to add bulges to the side, which could also act as shot traps from some angles. Valiant next crops up during the trials at Chertsey in April and May of 1945. The Vanguard had weighed around 20 tonnes, however after modifications from Rolls-Royce and then Ruston and Hornsby, the Holland turret now came to 27 tonnes fully loaded. The tests were to be focused around the quality of ride, and crew comfort and further suspension, along with pitch tests, however the vehicle broke down on the way. This was due to a human error, as our oil tanks had been overfilled due to a lack of a dipstick, but not an issue with the vehicle itself. Other problems did crop up. The driver was found to have suffered fatigue during driving, and further examination revealed this to be down to heavy tillers, which was deemed fixable by simply adding a lighter tiller system. Further problems were also found on the foot brakes, which were not correctly positioned for the driver, and thus he had to use his heel to make adjustments, but again these are quite simply fixable by adding a pedal over the bar. Sadly, a lot of misinformation has been spouted, indicating that the driver's foot was at risk of amputation. However, there is no mention of this in any of the official trial reports. On a more serious note, the gear lever was prone to sticking and was too short for the driver to get good leverage on. This also occurs in Valentine tanks and could have been remedied by simply increasing the stick size. Other listed faults were the grease nipples, which tended to come off. However, these are the same again as those on Valentine, and so should not have been a great issue. It is more than likely they were simply not screwed on correctly. The final observation made by the team was the process of checking the gearbox oil levels and adjusting steering brakes. Both of these necessitated the removal of rear axis levers, which were extremely heavy on this vehicle, and would have made field work arduous and dangerous, thus necessitating the fixture of large hinges to the bottom of each plate, which would have sufficed. So what lessons can be learnt from Valiant? It's often touted that Valiant was the worst tank ever made, but was this really the case? We know that Valiant was based on what was quite a good tank in many respects of its period, the Vanguard. The tank museum itself did not even know that the Vanguard hull was part of the Valiant, stating in several videos that she was a modified Valentine. But this isn't the case. It was my own research at the archives, as well as inspecting the vehicle, that revealed her true origins. Further work at Rolls-Royce was not a major issue either, however work done by Ruston and Hornsby was. The primary fault here is the overloading of a suspension system, simply not designed to take that weight. Other issues found were a mix of user faults and ergonomic problems inherent with any tank design. If we look at comparative vehicles, the Cromwell for example, a vehicle considered highly successful, it had many teething problems, from suspension arm failure, turret traverse problems, and the ability to decapitate its own crews. Meanwhile, the Crusader required as much as 200 man-hours per vehicle before they were even ready to see service once delivered, and Churchill had an entire book of faults found. However, one should note Valiant did not proceed further with testing, which may have found more faults as both Churchill and Cromwell did undergo longer testing periods, and all tanks have flaws when first inspected, which is why they're tested to start with. Ultimately, Valiant's failure was in being too little, too late. Her requirements had been surpassed and her development too slow. Her role was now superfluous and frankly there were better and more capable machines present to warrant any further investigation. Well guys, I hope you liked this chat about the Valiant's background. There will be more in future such as Heavy Valiant, a tank with armour to rival even at the Ag Tiger, and Valiant's connection to the Tortoise tanks. If you like this video or you want me to do more, then press that subscription thing with Bob down below and let me know what subjects you want or what you'd like me to research for you. Anyway, thanks so much guys. Toodle pip.